Welcome to Trial Lawyer View, a podcast for and about trial lawyers. We will tell the stories about trial lawyers who go to battle every day in courtrooms throughout the United States for injury victims. This is about their stories and their practices. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Lazarus, your host for Trial Lawyer View. Thank you for tuning in today for another episode. Trial Lawyer View is brought to you by Synergy Settlement Services. In full disclosure, I'm not a professional podcaster. Instead, my day job is Chief Executive Officer of Synergy Settlement Services. Synergy allows trial lawyers to focus on what they do best by handling the difficult issues that arise at settlement, like troublesome lien resolution issues, Medicare secondary payer compliance, government benefit preservation techniques, in complex settlement planning. Joining me today on Trial Law Review is Tom Edwards. I've known Tom for years and deeply respect his commitment to the civil justice system. He's an incredibly talented and successful trial lawyer. Tom is the senior partner of Edwards and Raggett's PA in Jacksonville. His practice focuses on representing the severely injured in matters of medical malpractice, wrongful death, motor vehicle accidents, nursing home abuse, products and premises liability, and general personal injury. Uh, And I'll read a little bit about his background because it's pretty significant. Uh, Tom's been a Florida board certified civil trial lawyer since 1991. He has a tier one best law firms ratings in both medical malpractice and personal injury. He's also rated AV preeminent by Mardell Hubble, was awarded the Spartans of Thermopylae Award for extraordinary work in protecting the court system, is included in Florida Trend Magazine's Legal Elite, and is recognized by Florida super lawyers. He's been practicing personal injury law since 1984. As the senior partner of Edwards and Raggett's, Tom and the team are committed to the aggressive and compassionate representation of clients and their families. His goal is to achieve justice for each client Edwards and Raggett's has repeatedly achieved extraordinary results, including landmark verdicts against multi-billion dollar corporations and insurance companies. Tom is a 1981 graduate of the University of the South Sewanee and received his Juris Doctorate degree in 1983 from Stetson University College of Law, where I got my LLM degree from, uh, which it's the oldest law school in the state of Florida. Uh, Tom's won so many awards that if I listed them all out, we would be here all day. They're on his firm's website at edwardsraggets.com. Welcome, Tom, to Trial Lawyer Review. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. We're excited to be here. So um, before we get into the the nitty-gritty, let's talk a little bit of personal stuff. Uh, So I know that you have three kids and you're an avid hunter. How do you balance a busy trial practice like you have with family and and time for some fun? Well, the reality is, Jason, uh, as you've probably observed in being around trial lawyers for many years, sometimes there's not a lot of balance. You you have to make sacrifices to be a good trial lawyer. Um, But uh, the flip side is it's it's the attitude of work hard, play hard. And so uh, when I do get time to go do something fun, I I try and do it with uh, passion and zeal, uh, just as we try to do the same thing when we're here at work representing clients. Yeah, understood. I'm I'm right there with you. It is tough. You know, I've got three kids as well. They're they're older now. So it's they have their own lives. But, you know, when we do get together, it's it's nice to have that focus time. And like you, I I've got some passions outside the office, like cycling. And so it's great to be able to get those times and and escape some of the pressures of, of dealing with what we all deal with every day. What's nice is uh, at least a couple of my kids enjoy the outdoors as much as I do, and uh, we're able to go hunt and fish and do things together outdoors. And my other son, uh, we have some some similar interests also, and and that means spending time together yelling at TVs while we're watching football games and things of that nature. Yeah, understood, understood. Same same page. So um, I wanted to ask you, there was a very interesting tidbit in your bio. Uh, It says that your grandmother was active in the women's suffrage movement, leading the women of Randolph-Macon on a march in Washington, D.C. in support of 
the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. What's the significance of that to you, and how did that shape you in terms of your notions of justice? Well, let me let me say this. The, the, the story is I did not know about that until just in the last couple of years. Uh, my sister knew about it. Um, uh, I knew my grandmother as a tough, staid lady who uh, was very involved in both the church and the community and was a leader in the community. And I watched her stand up for things uh, uh, at various times in my life. And so she was an influence in that regard. Um, but as as the uh, anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment happened, which was last year in 2020, uh, one of the legal organizations I was involved with uh, had a had a uh, program going here in Jacksonville to celebrate it, and my sister saw it uh, on on social media, and posted a picture of my grandmother. Actually, sent me the picture of my grandmother with her younger sister preparing to lead a march in uh, uh, 1919. Uh, where she was, as you just said, leading the women of Randolph-Macon in marching in support of the women's suffrage uh, uh, amendment. And that amendment passed in 2020, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, 1920. It would have been 1920, uh, 100 years uh, before. And uh, uh, so I posted the picture and there was a story about it in the Florida Bar News. Uh, it, it was a surprise to me because I always knew her as a very conservative state lady. And there she was as a as a college student leading marches that were very controversial at the time. Uh, there were women who were attacked. There were women who were imprisoned and uh, uh, for supporting women's suffrage. So I, I know that you are very passionate about the civil justice system. Were there family members that were involved in uh, the law? Is that what made you decide to go to, to law school and ultimately make personal injury law your your career? Actually, no. I, I uh, my, my father was a physician, uh, was an eye surgeon, uh, though throughout his career he had served active duty in the Army and during the Korean conflict and uh, uh, got out and went back in and remained in the reserves through most of my life. Um, and my mother uh, was uh, went back to school late in life and became an ordained minister. Um, so we did uh, we did not have a lawyer in my immediate family. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was a prominent lawyer in North Carolina, and uh, actually at one point was being recruited to run for attorney general when he got sick and passed away. Um, I started pre-med, and uh, uh, I quickly realized while I was in college that I was smart enough to get through med school or, or I was smart enough to uh, uh, get to go to med school, uh, but that would mean a lot of sacrifices that I wasn't prepared to make. I, I, I was involved in playing sports and a fraternity and um, uh, school uh, politics and leadership, and uh, I made the choice to go a different direction because I wasn't going to be able to do it all and make it through med school, too. And, and uh, as I started deciding what to do, I worked for a law firm one summer uh, uh, for Howard Coker, who's a friend and a mentor here in Jacksonville, and uh, uh, I worked for them as a runner and uh, got to help and participate in some trials and, and was sold on going to law school and becoming a trial lawyer. So what is your behind your passion for trial law and being in the courtroom? You know, um, being a trial lawyer is uh, uh, has some similarities to being uh, a physician. Uh, you are uh, you are helping people. And, and uh, as a trial lawyer, you are, are dealing with uh, the, the conflicts of society and uh, you are are dealing with uh, uh, constitutional rights, uh, including the right to trial by jury. Um, when you uh, take on a person's case, you have a duty to put their case ahead of yourself and ahead of your firm and ahead of anything else going on. Uh, and uh, they are your your responsibility. You're what's called a fiduciary. And that means putting their, their interest ahead of your own. And, and that's the same, same responsibility a doctor owes a patient. And that means a doctor gets out of bed at 2 in the morning if they need to to go take care of a patient. And it's much the same way with trial lawyers. Um, you are responsible for doing whatever it takes within uh, reason and ethics to uh, represent your client and to do the best you can for them. Your website talks about 
the firm providing compassionate legal process. And I'm curious about that and your philosophy around representing the catastrophically injured. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, we owe a compassionate legal process and compassionate representation to all of our clients. Um, when, when we are dealing with truly catastrophically injured people, it really takes it up even a notch more. Um, the, the, some of the people we represent who have uh, catastrophic injuries and who, uh, who are not able to function independently um, due to loss of limbs, uh, brain injury, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, any number of other problems, um, is, uh, uh, is a daunting and, and stress-filled task. Um, you, you have to put their interests ahead of yours, as I said earlier, uh, but in some instances, you're representing people who who may live a much shorter life if they don't get top quality care. You're representing people who have truly extraordinary needs and who, um, as they're going through the legal system, uh, their meet, needs may not be met in all the ways that they need them to be met. And that means you have to do a lot of uh, hand-holding, helping to find solutions for them, sometimes outside of the legal system. And uh, it means uh, finding ways to meet what are truly extraordinary needs that these, these uh, people who are injured and their families and those who are their caregivers uh, need from the standpoint of just day-to-day -day living. Yeah, as a follow-up to that, I, I know your firm recognizes that there are these hardships that come with, with being injured, particularly in these catastrophic cases, and you've got the opportunity to help people that are going through a very, very tough time to ultimately get the outcome that they deserve uh, after being injured. That's something that I routinely talk about with our team since we get a similar opportunity to help, and having been through a personal injury case myself, I... I do believe firmly in what we do and the good that it ultimately brings. Can you talk about the most important part of that for you and your law firm? Uh, the, the most important part of that, uh, again, goes back to the needs of the client, and it means meeting the needs of the client uh, throughout the process and hopefully obtaining uh, uh, the best result that's available for them. Um, meeting the needs of the client uh, means that uh, in, in most instances, it's very rare at our firm not to have a team of people working on a case. Um, it, the, the, the way these cases work, um, no, almost no law firm handles one case at a time. And so we've got multiple cases going on. We've got responsibilities in the community and responsibilities to our family. And that means if I'm out taking a deposition in another case or, or out of the office for another reason, I need someone else here who is going to be able to meet the needs of the client if something happens or if something's going wrong or if they need help. Um, um, one, of the, one of the most important components of what we do uh, with these clients and their family uh, is also communication. Um, the, particularly in the last couple of years, Jason, as you know, uh, the COVID pandemic has had a profound effect on the system, and so the system has slowed down, and, and uh, there are times we can't get into court, and it's impacting access to depositions and accessing uh, access to hearings and other things that move cases. And that means that uh, uh, when we have someone who's catastrophically injured or has needs that are not being met because um, they can't work anymore. They can't. They 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 need medical care and other things that that they're having difficulty finding. Um, those 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 become magnified by the fact that the system is moving slower for these people, and um, that means we need to be here as a resource for them. And uh, so we have a team of people. We typically have at least two lawyers on every case. Uh, uh, we have a paralegal, uh, sometimes a nurse, uh, and uh, uh, a legal assistant all assigned to the case. And it means not only finding ways to ensure they know what's going on in their case and if things are moving slowly, why, um, we also uh, have to uh, find ways to help them solve problems in their day-to-day -day life that uh, uh, may be as simple as uh, helping them find care for something that's going on that they're struggling to find care for, or uh, if, if they, they have a uh, struggle finding uh, the money to pay for their electricity when they, they have machines that have to run to keep them going, we have to help find ways to solve those problems. That, 
actually leads into a good question about you know what the impact has been for your firm and for your clients with COVID and the fact that there is this backlog. I've talked to some lawyers out on the West Coast who say that it takes six to 12 months just to get a hearing to approve a settlement. Um, I'm curious, you know, what that's done in your view to your practice and also to your clients in terms of how justice is being served when the country's had such challenges. I have a, a two-part answer. Um, I think our, our just, the justices of our Supreme Court and uh, our chief judges around the state and uh, the lawyers around the state can say with some pride they've done many good things to keep the system running as best they can, uh, transitioning very quickly to Zoom hearings and Zoom depositions, judges making people show up to do what they need to do to keep cases moving, um, those those have all been, uh, I, Jason, as you know, I'm, I'm on a number of national boards, and it hadn't happened that way all the way across the country. And our, our state court system has done a good job under very trying and very difficult circumstances. But that does not mean everything is still moving the way it did before. Um, uh, we are still getting hearings. We are still getting depositions. There are times we run into problems with that uh, because of COVID. Um, but what has been profoundly impacted is the ability to move cases through the jury trial system because the ability to bring people into the courthouse with the COVID pandemic has been impacted. And um, um, to, to run the jury trial system, we have to bring hundreds of people in at the time, have them in a big room to be vetted, to make sure they're appropriate for jury service, and then have people in close quarters in jury boxes. And so... Uh, we had long periods of time where no trials went on uh, that not only impacted the civil justice system and people who we represent who have catastrophic injuries who where justice delayed can be justice denied. Some people die waiting on a trial. Some people uh, die waiting on getting care because because their case hasn't been resolved. But we've also had people locked up in, in jail or in prison who have not been able to get hearings because of the pandemic. Um, and so those are very difficult issues that our, our justices are acutely aware of and that, that leaders of our court system are acutely aware of. And we're trying to find solutions for through any number of different means. Um, it is not a problem that's been solved yet. And with the spikes that we're seeing due to the pandemic and uh, lack of some people getting vaccinated and lack of people wearing masks, um, we could be headed back towards worsening slowdowns uh, while we were just start, starting to come out of it. So uh, what I would say to everyone is um, set aside your political beliefs. Uh, believe the, the, the doctors that masks and vaccines do work because it is, it is impacting everyone, uh, both with serious illnesses. Uh, I think uh, uh, between 98 and 99% of the people that are in hospitals uh, right now it's over 90 percent uh, that are in hospitals right now are unvaccinated and between 98 and 99 percent of the people that are on uh, uh, respirators uh, are people that chose not to be vaccinated. Yeah, it's unfortunate, particularly, you know, for, for the clients we work with when they are catastrophically injured, as you said, justice delayed often means justice isn't served. So I know that you have developed a niche um, handling medical malpractice. I know you handle a lot of other types of litigation as well when your firm does, but how, how did you develop your niche and area within the medical malpractice uh, area? Well, Jason, to some degree, it goes back to me starting pre-med. Uh, I started out uh, it, doing all the pre-med stuff. I, at the same time, uh, worked not only as a firefighter, but I, I was an emergency medical technician and worked on ambulances, worked in an emergency room for a period of time. Um, and when I made the decision to go become a lawyer, uh, I wanted to do uh, my goal was to get to do medical malpractice. And I started out uh, with one of the most prominent defense firms in the state um, and worked. Uh, the first two firms I worked with, we did uh, uh, defense work for some of the largest corporations and insurance companies in the, in the nation. Um, everything from uh, uh, malpractice carriers to railroads to uh, uh, you name it, Walmart, Burger King, uh, Winn-Dixie, et cetera. 
Um, and a major part of my practice was doing medical malpractice defense, nursing home defense, and things of that nature. I represented some of the largest uh, uh, healthcare chains in, in, in the country, uh, represented the state board of regents, meaning all the medical schools in, in the state, uh, represented uh, some of the largest nursing home chains in the state, and then made the decision to transition over to the plaintiff side, uh, having having gotten fantastic experience doing that and getting to try a bunch of cases on the defense side. So when you're handling a, a complex medical malpractice case with catastrophic type of injuries, what are the top three things you do to try and empathize with the client and their family to tell their story to the jury so that the jury really has an understanding of of what's transpired and why justice needs to be served? Um, the, the, the number one thing is uh, getting to know your client, getting to know uh, what they're going through, uh, learning what they're living with, uh, both from their own standpoint and from their caregiver standpoint. Um, and if you don't understand and appreciate those things, then it, it, it makes it far more difficult to effectively present it to a jury. It means... Um, going out and seeing where they live. It means looking at their daily routine. It means talking to them them if they're capable of conversing. It means talking to caregivers uh, if they're not, uh, and going and watching some of what they go through, uh, spending part of days with them. Uh, um, a second part of that is uh, the, the day in the life uh, type videos uh, so that a jury can get a glimpse into what they truly are living with and truly going through. Uh, and ensuring that you're able to tell the story effectively. The old old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words is absolutely true uh, when it comes to demonstrating injuries and video showing what people go through uh, in their day-to-day -day lives when they are total care patients is, is really essential as far as helping a jury to understand the needs of, of the catastrophically injured and uh, and how, how tremendous the impact is on them and their loved ones that are with them every day. Yeah, you know, we, we use some of those techniques actually internally for our team to understand the importance of the clients that we serve, you know, why it's so important to fight so hard, you know, reducing that erisaline or dealing with Medicare or, you know, the, the financial protection of the recovery after the case has settled. I mean, all those things you know, we use to demonstrate to our team about just what people go through because it's so hard in the abstract to understand it. But when you see those day in the life or really get an understanding of what they're dealing with day to day after being injured, it's 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 pretty eye opening, I think, for most people that, you know, have not been through something like that. It is. And um, uh, having compassion for those people, I think, is enhanced by uh, uh, our staff and others, folks that work on the cases like you, uh, being able to see what they go through. Uh, it, it, it makes it a whole lot easier to take that call at two in the morning saying, hey, I'm having a crisis, I'm having a problem, and I need help. Absolutely. Uh, so, You've gotten some incredible results. I wanted to ask you about a couple of um, cases that were particularly noteworthy. Um, and the first one is is a pretty incredible story. I've I've seen some of the clips from interviews post uh, verdict on this case. It was a $178 million medical malpractice verdict that I understand turned into a $228 million judgment ultimately with prejudgment interest and fees and costs for a um, former deputy, uh, Clay Chandler. I, I know that medical malpractice cases are typically very tough to litigate and win. So what was special about getting that verdict for him? I, I mean, I know it from seeing him interviewed how emotional it seemed like that that case was for him and his family. Um, the, the injury that Clay suffered, to use the words of the trial judge that presided over the case, uh, the, they, the defense challenged the verdict, and the trial judge entered an order upholding it, saying that it was the worst injury she'd seen in her entire career. 
Uh, he suffered profound brain damage uh, as well as uh, contractures where his body was curled up in a fetal position with his hands, his elbows, his knees. Nothing worked anymore. Uh, it was all locked into place. Uh, he had bed sores. He was blinded. Uh, and he had uh, a brain injury that um, um, impaired his executive function. He was very emotionally labile, meaning he, he, he cried and became very emotional at the drop of the hat. His, his speech was profoundly impaired, and he spoke at the level of a two- or a three-year-old. And, uh, but based on testing, he was very close to what's called locked-in syndrome, where he understood what was going on around him. Uh, he understood that he was being groomed to be the sheriff of Clay County. Uh, he had just been uh, chosen to go to the FBI Academy for training to be a top executive law enforcement officer and he, when he had this surgery. And the surgery uh, went catastrophically wrong. Uh, the, the problem that he had, which was an internal leak following a, a bariatric surgery, which is where they clip the stomach and reduce the size of the stomach, um, he, the leak was not identified for a long period of time when it should have been. And, uh, by the time that time they went in to try and fix it, he, uh, was septic and he lost his blood pressure and had what's called a low flow stroke. He, he bottomed out, meaning his blood, there wasn't, his, his body was forcing, uh, blood to the core of the, of the body to keep the heart, the lungs, the, the, the liver and the kidneys alive. And he lost blood pressure so so profoundly that uh, he had a stroke. And uh, uh, in the aftermath of the stroke, he was in in the uh, in the CCU um, and was uh, uh, intubated. And they neglected to put salve in his eyes because he's medicated uh, and doesn't have the ability to blink on his own. He had already lost some, some some vision through the cortical blindness caused by the the stroke, uh, and he lost the rest of his vision because his cornea is burned up. And uh, uh, the end result of that case uh, was that the jury found uh, the hospital liable. Um, they um, indicated that they they defended by saying they weren't liable that these were problems that are a known complication of this type of surgery and. Uh, uh, they indicated that if they were liable, it was the surgeon's fault. Um, and uh, after a two to three week trial, the trial went into a third week. The jury uh, obviously made the finding that they found. Um, we were told early on in the case that they were going to run us off the field. And uh, uh, these clients uh, were in a, a horrible circumstance. Uh, uh, Clay's wife was caring for him. Uh, 24 hours a day when she wasn't at work. Uh, she was working long hours uh, as uh, as a deputy uh, also, and she ran the jail at the time and would have to go to work every day and come home and care for him until she couldn't do any more and had to go to sleep. And her retired parents would then step in and try to help care for him. He was curled up in a fetal position. He couldn't feed himself, couldn't drink water on his own, uh, couldn't roll over. If he wasn't moved periodically, he would get bed sores. And uh, in handling in handling that case, it was apparent that uh, if we if we failed to get a good recovery that gave them the ability to improve his quality of care, he likely wouldn't survive. Um, it was it was a a very difficult case and uh, uh, one that uh, uh, was extremely emotional for both of them when we were successful. Uh, and and the, the great part of the story, Jason, is that with the ultimate, it, it's, it took about a year after the verdict before it settled. Um, but once it settled amicably, uh, they were able to afford to uh, move into a new home, bring in 24-hour day caregivers. And most importantly, they built a uh, physical therapy suite adjoining the home and brought in a physical therapist multiple times each week. And Clay enrolled in a program at Brooks Rehab here in Jacksonville where they were able to work to get all of his, his limbs where they were working again. So he was no longer curled up in a fetal position, confined to one position in bed unless someone turned him. And he is now able to uh, walk in what's called an upright walker. He has to be strapped into it, and he is still blind. He still needs 24-hour day care. But he is now functional. He is able to go to Jaguars games. He is able to, uh, through through a number of years of grueling, painful, difficult physical therapy, 
He is now back at least functional and able to participate in life outside of a bed. Well, it certainly demonstrates, you know, what trial lawyers do every day, which is, you know, improve the quality of life for their clients when something like this has transpired. We've seen it and, you know, I, I consider it a, um, a real uh, privilege and responsibility that we have when we assist in those kinds of circumstances because that is what can be done when there's enough dollars there to help somebody after something like this occurs. So uh, that's it's great to hear that there's been at least some improvement, even though what, what happened was, was a pretty devastating thing. Yeah. Um, the, the second case um, that I wanted to ask you about was a, a $23 million recovery for a brain injured child and um, what, what the importance of that particular case was to you? Um, representing uh, babies who have been badly injured uh, and have uh, brain injury is, is, uh, is, is difficult and as grueling as, as the case with, with Clay. Um, you, you, are, you know that um, getting them care will impact the quality of their life for, for decades. Uh, getting, them, getting them an appropriate recovery and an appropriate level of care may impact their ability to live for decades, um, as opposed to having a very short-lived life. Um, uh, this, this child uh, was not taken as early as she should have, despite clear signs in, uh, um, in fetal heart monitor strips showing that she was getting deeper and deeper into trouble. Uh, there were delays in getting the doctor in to uh, uh, take her and have her delivered, uh, despite the fact that uh, uh, she was uh, uh, losing losing the baby's pulse and uh, uh, explaining the field heart monitor strips can be complex. Um, but um, it, once the baby was taken, uh, it became apparent that there had been oxygen deprivation and that resulted in cerebral palsy and some very significant long-term uh, consequences to the child as far as an inability to function normally for the rest of her life. And uh, um, being able to make a significant recovery uh, that uh, provides for uh, around-the-clock needs for a child who is born um, with this type of impairment, you are planning literally for the rest of their life. And so you have to plan past when the parents are going to be gone. Uh, there may or may not be siblings. And you have to, you have to then take whatever recovery you're able to, to get for them in, in achieving the justice you're able to achieve and, and plan it out so that uh, you are maximizing the use of that recovery to ensure that it doesn't just care for them for the next year or two. They, it's not about going and buying some something nice or extravagant. You're having to plan how they're going to be cared for, not just one year from now or five years from now or 20 years from now, but potentially 50 and 60 and 80 years from now. And, uh, and ensuring that that nest egg that you're able to achieve and whether you have, if it's not a large recovery, whether you then have to integrate governmental benefits and things of that nature, they're going to truly help take care of that child for the rest of their life. If you were talking to a younger lawyer who was getting ready to uh, embark on a career of handling medical malpractice cases and you knew we're going to handle cases like these, what, what would be your top piece of advice for preparing them to handle cases such as this? Um, I, I guess I, I'd give a couple of pieces of advice. Number one is uh, be prepared to work very long, hard hours, and uh, the people that are are prepared to outwork their opposition are usually going to do well. It, you are going to have top-tier lawyers on the other side of you, and you're going to have lawyers who are hardworking people. I, I was on the other side for a number of years in handling these cases. They're going to be smart, they're going to be good, and they're going to work hard. And if you're not willing to outwork them, then you're doing a client's disservice and you shouldn't get into it. Uh, the second thing that I would tell them is you need to go learn about how to teach effectively. My, my, the grandmother we talked about earlier that led the marches for Randolph-Macon for a number of years was a teacher. And um, um, lawyers, at the end of the day, trial lawyers uh, are teachers. And uh, that means finding uh, the most effective ways to teach complex ideas and complex uh, issues 
to a jury in a condensed period of time. And so uh, when you when you go into the, the complex litigation, meaning medical malpractice, nursing home products liability is contrasted with, for example, premises liability or automobile accident cases, it's even more daunting and it's even more challenging in the way you have to teach yourself and with your experts. And the reason I say that is this. Um, when you end up with a jury in a automobile case, um, you you will have ninety eight percent of the time, maybe ninety nine percent of the time, people on that jury who drive cars and who know the rules of the road and who know what the responsibility of drivers are and pedestrians are and bicyclists like you are. Um, in a premises liability case, we all walk through parking lots every day and we wa all walk through grocery stores every day. Um, so you've got a jury that understands the big picture of the case and you're teaching them about safety standards. Um, and they may not be it's, you know, specifically trained in that, but they have a foundational knowledge. In a medical malpractice case, a nursing home case, a product liability case, uh, an engineering case, the, the complex cases, most people in the jury aren't trained in those areas. And so the teaching is even more complex and you go into it and you have to find ways to simplify the most complex ideas and the understandable bites. It's, it's like, how do you eat an elephant? You, you do it one bite at a time and you have to teach the same way and you have to do it in a condensed period of time and you have to take very complex ideas and complex standards and teach them to the jury so that they understand it. And you're doing this in the same setting where the other side's trying to teach them a contrary point of view. So switching gears, I, I know that you are incredibly devoted to trial law organizations that you are a part of, the FJA, your past president, uh, ABOTA, which I know you're involved in leadership with. Can you highlight a couple of important points about why those organizations are so important and why you are involved with them? Sure. Um, I, all of us uh, as lawyers take an oath to protect and preserve uh, the constitutional system uh, that we are a part of. And going, going to your office and doing work for clients every day is, is essential and doing good work is essential. But we take an oath to do more than that. Being a professional, whether it's a doctor or a lawyer, uh, is, is a privilege. We don't have a right to come in and practice law. We don't have a right to represent people. It's a privilege. And in taking the oath to protect and preserve our system, that means working to ensure that the system is there in the future and that the system is strong. And that means spending time when you're not representing clients uh, working to protect the system. Both the FJA and ABOTA do that, and they both do it in different ways. Um, the Florida Justice Association is an organization of plaintiff's lawyers throughout the state, and we all compete with each other for business. Um, but once, once we have a case, we should all be supporting each other and working to help people get the best results they can for clients. And I can tell you that without the FJA, I don't think um, our, our, our lawyers in this state would have done nearly as good a job in representing people, whether it's in medical malpractice, whether it's in uh, product liability, whether it's in nursing home cases, because we share knowledge about what's going on uh, with these defendants. We share knowledge about what's going on in the courtroom. We share knowledge about the effective way in which to present things. Um, and that is essential to being quality lawyers. The additional thing the FJA does that um, is, is something that is essential to the consumers and the working people of this state and to every lawyer that represents uh, plaintiffs in this state is that they go and they monitor what goes on in Tallahassee. Every single year, uh, we have the Chamber of Commerce and insurance carriers going in trying to change the law to benefit large corporations and to take away consumers' rights to protect themselves and to protect their loved ones. They try to change laws to put caps on damages. They try to change laws to change the standards by which cases are proven. And the FJA has a team of lobbyists and, and lawyers who, who have gone through leadership, who go over year after year after year, 
to explain to the legislators why the people that they elected them deserve better and deserve to have a system that works for people, not to protect corporations. Um, it, it is we all want a, a good health care system. We all want um, we all want our economy to work well, but we also want safety and we want reasonable safety for uh, our health care system, for uh, the grocery stores we go into, for uh, the streets and the way in which the, the traffic system is run. And uh, the FJA works to do that in a way that no other organization in this state does. Let me segue just briefly and talk about ABOTA, uh, because uh, ABOTA is an organization uh, of both trial lawyers and judges uh, who have to try a certain number of cases before they can be elected and uh, invited to join ABOTA. Uh, and it is both plaintiff and defense. And uh, I'll use a different word than I use sometimes. There's a no jerk rule in, in a boat up uh, for membership. And that means the people that get in not only are good at what they do, but they're professional in the way they do it. And uh, we have some of the top both plaintiff and defense lawyers in the state in that organization. And, and the, the two primary commitments you make when you join the organization is you take take an oath to protect the civil justice system, and that means protecting the independence of the judiciary, which is the third branch of government, which serves as a check and balance on the other branches of government, and you work to protect the Seventh Amendment, which is the right to civil jury trials, which came over to us from England because it used to be that the king or his appointees decided all disputes, and now people from our community decide disputes. And so that organization works to protect those two things and does it effectively, works hard to do it, and uh, has lots and lots of programs that uh, include uh, a teacher's law school where we teach teachers about the importance of uh, the Constitution and the civil justice system, and we help them in, in teaching the kids as they go through school on those issues. We have people that go into to high schools and do programs. Uh, we have professionalism uh, uh, programs for young lawyers in, in communities throughout the state, and it goes on from there. I, I love seeing how groups like FJA you know, support each other in terms of their practices through the listservs and the collegiality in the profession uh, in terms of other trial lawyers helping other trial lawyers is pretty unique, and it's such a, a great thing to see because ultimately it's helping, as you said, those people uh, who are being represented by those lawyers get the best possible outcome. And you know the, the idea of ABOTA, the, this idea of professionalism and protecting the civil justice system, again, those are just such an important things. That's why I typically ask guests I have on the podcast about why they're part of it because I, I think it's such a unique thing about the profession and really is what um, is is you know a very good thing about this this group of uh, lawyers that are part of of all of those those organizations I, I, Jason I'd be remiss if I didn't brag just a little bit this past weekend the Jacksonville Aboda chapter uh, received recognition as the national chapter of the year for the best programs put on throughout the nation. And it's the third time we've received that award. We're the only chapter in the nation that has received the award three times. And uh, I think it speaks well of what we do. I can tell you that we, we just as the FJA, you have plaintiff's lawyers working together to help train each other, to help exchange information about handling cases. The ABOTA chapters throughout Florida uh, work together in exchanging information about programs, ideas on how to do what we do. And we wouldn't have gotten there without the support of all the other ABOTA chapters and, and the group called FLABOTA, which coordinates the entire state. So we're very proud of what we do. Uh, and, and I have to say, as a past president of the FJA, I'm very proud of what they do because it's, it's, it's preserved a system of justice in our state that wouldn't be here otherwise. And some states don't have the system of justice that we do. So having built a very successful law practice, um, what's the one tip you would give other trial lawyers that's been part of the secret of your success in, in building that practice? Um, you know, coming up with just one tip is very difficult because the uh, the first thing that jumps into my mind is what I said earlier. You got to be willing to work hard. You 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 need to. There are a lot of different aspects of 
doing well in the, uh, on behalf of clients in the legal community, particularly as a trial lawyer. But I, I, I will tell you that uh, a major part of what has helped me get where I am is uh, being willing to roll up my sleeves and, and, and work hard, and, uh, and, but not just work hard for clients, work hard for organizations, work hard for the legal system. I don't think I would be where I am today from the standpoint of having a successful firm had I not been out working through the Jacksonville Bar Association, the, the uh, ABOTA, uh, Florida Justice Association, uh, and a number of other organizations because I've developed relationships with people who have helped me. I continue to help others. I was on the phone this morning with a young lawyer who has a trial coming up in October, and I'm going to help them with it if they need help. Uh, I've told them they can make the decision if they want me to step in and help try it. Going to your office every day and working your rear end off for a client is essential if you're going to be a good trial lawyer. Uh, but, but, You've got to do more if you're going to really succeed. Um, I, I don't think I could possibly be the successful lawyer that, that I am, nor nor have the firm successes that we've had were I not engaged with all these other people throughout uh, these other legal organizations because they've made me a better lawyer and they've they've given me the opportunity to work on cases I wouldn't have had access to otherwise because They've gotten to know me through these organizations, and they, they trust the work that we're doing, and they trust the way in which we do it. And I have to say, I've talked about legal organizations, but it's not just limited to that. We, we encourage everybody in our firm, both from a legal, the, the lawyer standpoint, but from the staff standpoint, too, to get involved in not just legal organizations, but in the community, because uh, we have an obligation to give back. We're in the midst of a, of a campaign to help uh, uh, the Cancer Society right now with uh, a group called uh, Real Men Wear Pink. I've got my, my pink tie on, and we're fundraising to try to eradicate breast cancer. Um, uh, we get involved in, in uh, Dreams Come True, uh, where uh, kids that uh, have uh, have serious illnesses or diseases uh, are, are given a trip or some other benefit that they, they really would enjoy and, and make a priority. We, those are two that are coming up right away, and there are a number of others we get involved in. And I, I got to say that um, a, out of all the advice I would give a young lawyer, I would say uh, you got to work hard, but not just in your profession. You, you've got to work hard uh, for clients, you got to work hard to improve your profession, and you got to work hard in your community. And if you do those things, it's going to come back to, to pay dividends long term. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. We we actually give all of our staff the option to take as many days off without having to take PTO uh, to do charitable work or work in the community. Obviously, COVID's made it harder, but you know we've done uh, things for Make a Wish and and different entities here locally uh, for the American Diabetes Association. We annually support Tour de Cure and some of these other things because I do think that we have an obligation to give back and that is part of the way that you um, you you are successful is is by giving back, not just taking. That That's an important, important aspect. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, so last question, and I will admit it is a bit self-serving. Just curious about what you see as the most challenging aspects when you're settling cases uh, today, whether it's Medicare or government benefits or lien holders that have become very aggressive. Um, well, what is it that, that you find most challenging and maybe it's changed because I, I, you, you have been practicing a, a fair bit of time. So I'm curious about your, what you've seen. Um, Jason, the, uh, the thing that most, um, not all, but most defense lawyers and most, uh, uh, adjusting personnel do have no appreciation of is what we go through at the end of cases on behalf of clients. And, uh, uh, it has evolved into such a complex system that there are numerous companies, uh, uh, that have uh, have come about that help people with with those difficult problems, um, including your company. Um, it, it, we not only uh, have a responsibility for planning for the financial well-being of of clients, which will uh, include advising clients what annuities are, which is part of what you do, and advising clients that 
They need a, a total balanced plan, which may include planning for governmental benefits with things called uh, 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 special, special needs trusts that, that allow them to continue to get cert, certain types of governmental benefits. We, we have to plan for uh, money to be put where they can obtain it if they need it for quick needs. Uh, we, we have to, uh, before actually getting them the money, we have to also deal with things that are called liens. And very few people know that when they read about these big verdicts that there may be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of medical bills. And in virtually every single case we handle, we are paying back health insurance carriers, Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, uh, some other entity that is there with their handout. And now we also have to plan potentially for paying them in the future if they're paying for care for harm that was done by someone else. And so when people hear about these enormous verdicts, um, the, the reality is that a meaningful amount of money in almost every case that we handle in our firm goes to governmental entities or insurance carriers. And, and they get to sit back and do nothing while our clients go through the heartache and the difficulties of litigation. We invest our own money in prosecuting the cases, and yet we then get to the end and we have to pay them percentages of the money. And that, that to a large degree, is fair because uh, they have fronted the money to pay medical bills for people who were injured by someone else. The problem we get into is frequently they come in and want a lot more than is fair. Um, they will come in and they'll, they'll lump all kinds of care. For example, in a bed sore case, we may have someone who is elderly and in a nursing home, and uh, they'll still lump in every other aspect of care that the patient got, which they were going to have to have no matter what. And we spend months fighting with them over whether they have the right to be reimbursed for a wheelchair uh, and whether they have a right to be reimbursed for a specialty bed and whether they have a right to be reimbursed for the hospital gowns and, and all kinds of other things that had nothing to do with the bed sore where they we, we're telling them you absolutely have the right to be reimbursed for bed sore care. And, and so... There are now companies that assist us in doing those things that frequently are using folks from insurance carriers or who used to work for insurance carriers or Medicare or other entities that have these rights. Uh, and uh, and, it, and it, is, it is making the burden lighter on us, but it still is, is demanding difficult time. And, and if we miss a step, frequently we're the ones that end up eating it. Yeah, you know, we, we call it the case after the case, which really it is for you guys and for trial lawyers. It's it's such a broad, complex area of issues that it's tough to to have you know a good even base of knowledge, much less you know understanding all the intricacies of it. And I experienced some of it myself when I got injured and had to negotiate my own lien because I wanted to do that just so I had a better feel for it and fighting with, you know, my health insurer and, and you know, making the arguments about why they should not recover 100, you know, cents on the dollar when I was not recovering 100 cents on the dollar for for all my injuries. It's, it is a, um, you know, it is a, an area that is, has a lot of liability and is complex, frankly, and that's, you know, that is a reason why companies like us exist. Um, so appreciate you sharing your, your insight on that. Um, so, you know, if a lawyer uh, listening to this wants to get in touch with you, if they've got a case in your area or interested in co-counseling a case with you, what's the best way for someone to reach out to you? Uh, our phone number is uh, 904-399-1609 or my email. Obviously, they can find it on the bar website uh, or on our, our email or our on edwardsragots.com. Uh, but my email is, is tse at edwardsragots.com. And we'll put Tom's contact information um, with the show notes uh, on the website when the podcast is put up on the website. So, Thank you for tuning in today for Trial Lawyer View, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to Trial Lawyer Review. You can find more at triallawyerview.com and look for more episodes and more content coming in the future.